Ladies and gentlemen, I am the American Spy Fox. Welcome to the channel where today we are going to be reading chapter nine, a very important chapter of Nirvana Come As You Are by Michael Azarad. Chapter nine is not very long, but I feel it's important. There are some things in it I want to talk about, so there's going to be reading and commentary as well. Just a friendly reminder, if you don't got it, get it. NordVPN, secure and protect your data, encrypt it, do what you gotta do to protect yourself online. Identity theft is not funny, Jim. Millions of people suffer every year. I would not be in an affiliate partnership with this company if I did not believe in it. I've turned down sponsorships before because their product was crap. No problems with NordVPN. Good company, solid product. They do what they say they're gonna do. It's that simple. I just had a conversation with some family members or I guess not family members, in-law members about how they need it. Cause they're always doing banking and all this stuff on the internet. I'm like, man, you can't just be cruising online without any security, man. Encrypt that shizzle. Once I explained to them how important it was, they were like, yeah, we need to get on this. NordVPN secures, shields, encrypts your data. You can be from wherever you want and you can watch movies and TV shows that are being seen in other countries. I just changed my geographical location this past Sunday to watch the Bengals game. Instead of airing the Bengals Ravens game, my area was airing the Browns Steelers game. And I changed it to Washington DC, got to watch the Bengals. If you can't tell, I'm, I'm a firm believer in this. Ever since I figured out how dangerous it is to be online and, and what this product does, I'm, I'm seriously into it. I've been telling everybody about it. Plus, you can use it on, I believe, up to five devices. So your phone, your laptop, your tablet, your TV, it works on multiple devices. So again, without any further ado, we're gonna get on to chapter nine. Again, there's gonna be commentary in this one. Uh, there's something I wanna talk about once we get to it. Nevermind came out without a lyric sheet. I guess I wasn't confident enough, Kurt says. At first, he wanted to print some of his poems then some revolutionary debris, then nothing at all. No pictures or anything. At the last minute, he picked some lines out of the songs and a couple that aren't in any of the songs and ran them together into a poem. Kurt says revolutionary debris, quote unquote, meant all kinds of anarchistic revolutionary essays and diagrams about how to make your own bomb. And I just thought we'd better hold off on that, Kurt says. If we ever really want to do that, we'd be more effective if we gained popularity first. Then people might actually think twice about it, rather than us alienating everybody right off the bat. But once we started to get really popular, it was really hard to hold back. We played the game as long as we could. It is now time to make it unclear. Part of playing the game is going out to dinner with powerful music magazine editors and pretending to be friendly with them so they'll give the band an article or a favorable review. On one of these junkets, the band went out to lunch at a swank Beverly Hills eatery with RIP magazine editor Lon Friend. Yes, his last name is Friend, F-R-I-E-N-D. Before lunch, Kurt, Chris, and Dave visited Friend's office. I looked up on his wall and I noticed that Lon had a fetish says Kurt, a rock and roll butt fetish. He has to have all these pictures taken with him and up and coming bands where either he's naked or the bands have to drop their pants. He's pinching their butts. There are all these pictures of him with naked rock stars that have been in this magazine. He's in the bathtub naked and they're standing around him and it started to scare me. If you are an avid viewer of my channel, you've heard me talk about all the humiliating things that people have to go through to become famous. Remember that there are executive CEOs who can make this dream happen for you. And I've talked about how Courtney Love went through these things and it didn't bother her because she had worked in an industry as a young woman that you had to humble yourself and humiliate yourself. So to her, if that's what I gotta do to get famous, that's what I gotta do. Now here's Kurt Cobain telling you that I went to this editor's office and he was going to put Nirvana in the magazine, but he was going to want to humiliate us. He was going to want us to drop our pants and let him take pictures. And it's really weird stuff. These guys are on a really big power ego trip. Listen to what happens. It was a disgusting scene, quote by Kurt Cobain. 
It was a disgusting scene because we were basically pimping our personalities to this person to see if he liked us before he decided to promote us. Kurt continues, It was the most sickening thing I ever experienced. I just decided to not say a word and sit there and be pissed off and act really insane. The only words he said to me after he got up to leave were, Kurt, you shouldn't talk so much. He was really offended, totally pissed off. Sure enough, RIP magazine did not support Nirvana until it practically had to at the height of Nirvana mania. This editor decided, well, I'm not going to support your band. You don't want to be nice to me and let me have this power over you and probably ask them for one of these pictures just like he has on his wall. You don't want to humble yourself before me and grovel at my feet and let me humiliate you then I'm not going to support your band. But eventually Nirvana, as we know, takes over the world and then he has no choice. He's got to run Nirvana because that's what everybody's talking about. He probably thought at the time, well, if I don't support this band, they're not going to make it anywhere. And then they'll have to come back and then they'll let me humiliate them. This is a prime example. And I'm sure Kurt probably said much more, but Michael Azrad left it out of the book to cover his butt. Lon Friend, editor of R.I.P. Magazine, very popular in the 90s, was one of these creeps that would basically assault people. If these people he's got in pictures on his walls that Kurt says became rock stars, if they've allowed him to do this, a picture with their pants down, what do you think he was doing when no one was taking pictures behind closed doors? You see what I'm saying? So sure enough, Rip didn't support Nirvana until it practically had to at the height of Nirvana mania. When the band refused to cooperate anymore with Rip after the magazine ran a special edition on the band without their permission, the letters page just happened to feature more and more anti-Nirvana screeds. If we were smart, says Kurt, we would have played the game a little bit longer to get the acceptance of the Rip readers to where they liked us so much that no matter what we said, it wouldn't matter but we blew our wad too soon. But at the same time, I feel sorry for those kids. I was one of them. You can't blame a 14 year old kid for calling someone a fag if he's grown up in an environment where his stepdad has been saying this for years and it's, it's an accepted thing that you're practically forced to do. So that makes me admire Kurt Cobain all the more that he would not do something like that just to get his band in this huge magazine. And again, it should tell you something about the people who run media. That's why it's so important to support content creators like me who will bring you media without any um, hidden agenda, you know, so to speak, ulterior motive. While oldsters called Kurt's lyrics incoherent, his Whitman samplers of images, ideas, and emotions fitted the short attention spans of channel hopping kids everywhere. I very rarely write about one theme or one subject, Kurt once told the Seattle Times. I end up getting bored with that theme and write something else halfway through the rest of the song and finish the song with a different idea. It's funny that in the 90s, right, this book comes out in the 90s, they're, they're saying the short attention spans of channel hopping kids everywhere. When we were kids, uh, you know, we, we had satellite TV and 200 channels and you're just constantly flipping through channels and the adults said, oh, it's going to ruin their attention spans. Uh, they're, they're flipping through channels. And now we say, oh, kids are watching TikTok videos. It's going to ruin their attention spans. There's probably studies, you know, I'm not going to really comment on it because I don't know. I haven't read those studies. But if you think about it, we were doing the same thing when we were kids. We'd watch a channel for like 30 seconds and flip to the next one. Like the Pixies Black Francis, Kurt didn't necessarily write his lyrics for linear sense. They're at their most successful when words and music collide to produce a powerful and distinct third sensation, a denial, a denial, teen spirit, and I don't have a gun, come as you are, she said, breed, or even a good old yeah, repeated 13 times for emphasis in lithium. Most of the lyrics come from lines of poetry that Kurt writes in a spiral bound notebooks every night before going to sleep. So the impressionistic quality comes mostly from the juxtaposition of seemingly unrelated lines rather than a stream of consciousness approach from word to word. So this has always been this argument. Did Kurt Cobain's lyrics mean anything? Well, yeah. If he's writing in a journal daily, putting his thoughts to paper, 
and then he's picking those lines out of the journal at the time he wrote it it meant something to him now he might pick different lines from you know different days because they rhyme or they match up or they they, they fit but it doesn't mean that he wasn't thinking about something when he wrote the line in his journal right the effect is like a musical rar satch test r r-o-r-s-c-h-a-c-h -H test call me stupid but i've never seen this word i don't know what it means but more importantly they added up to very coherent ideas and emotions that you can comprehend conceptually of course sometimes even kurt got a little confused what the hell am i trying to say he sang on a, on a plane in his songwriting, Kurt deals in extremes and opposites that animate the songs. One of the most famously obscure couplets in Smells Like Teen Spirit was a mulatto, an albino, a mosquito, my libido. It is really nothing more than two pairs of opposites. A funny way of saying the narrator is very horny. I always thought he was saying because, you know, he is experimenting with opiates quite a bit going into the Nevermind era. And as we know, come December, January, February uh, 92, he'd be doing it on a regular basis with Courtney Love, which he talked about her getting him opiates, getting him street dope in this book during that time. I always kind of thought what he was saying was when he says, and this is just my opinion, I'm probably wrong, a mosquito, my libido, I thought he meant like he he doesn't have a libido. So opiates are known to suppress your libido. They can even, over long-term use, they can even cause impotency and, you know, guys on opiates are usually not interested in uh, sexual escapades. So I thought he was comparing his libido to a uh, mosquito maybe that's wrong yeah uh, michael azared sees it another way that he's very horny i guess because a mosquito can penetrate uh, i don't know i i don't really know maybe you guys have a better opinion than i do the lyrics often loft an idea and then shoot it down with one little burst of cynicism even the music echoes the dynamic contrast of the imagery many of the songs smells like teen spirit and lithium foremost alternate between subdued rippling sections and all-out screaming blitzkriegs while the album itself encompasses songs like the acoustic poly and the majestic something in the way as well as primal scream workouts like territorial pissings and stay away kurt is smart enough to recognize that the dualities are a reflection of himself and perhaps his audience i'm such a nihilistic jerk half the time and other times i'm so vulnerable and sincere he says that's pretty much how every song comes out it's like a mixture of both of them them. That's how most people my age are. They're sarcastic one minute and then caring the next. It's a hard line to follow. Few songs on Nevermind combine that mixture better than Teen Spirit. It was basically a scam, Kurt says of the song. It was just an idea that I had. I felt a duty to describe what I felt about my surroundings and my generation and people my age. One night, Kurt and Kathleen Hanna from Bikini Kill had gone out drinking and then went on a graffiti spree, spray painting Olympia with revolutionary and feminist slogans, including the ever popular God is gay. When they got back to Kurt's apartment, they continued talking about teen revolution and writing graffiti on Kurt's walls. Hannah wrote the words, Kurt smells like teen spirit. I took that as a compliment, says Kurt. I thought that was a reaction to the conversation we were having, but it really meant that I smelled like the deodorant. I didn't know that the deodorant spray existed until months after the single came out. I've never worn any cologne or underarm deodorant. Virtually ever since he arrived, Kurt had been inundated with the Calvinist discussions of teen revolution in Olympia coffee shops. After all, that's what Bohemian people in their early 20s do. It's in the rule book. I knew there was some kind of revolution, he says. Whether it was a positive thing or not, I didn't really care or know. Uh, Olympia at this time, what they mean by the Calvinists is uh, Calvin Johnston, I believe his name, Calvin Johnson. He owned a, a record company, K Records. He owned a coffee shop i think they had a bar they had their own little community and everybody who sort of like worshiped this guy and his ethos hung out at the places that k records owned and these are impressionable young kids no one ever talks about the fact that he was an older dude who used his reputation around this record company coffee shop bar all the hangouts that he owned to um sleep with college girls he sort of spread this you know come as you are man and everybody shares everything and we're all just swingers dude yeah he kind of used that to his advantage to hook up with young girls but no one ever talks about that side of it today we would call it grooming 
The Calvinist would bridle at the comparison, but in many respects, Teen Revolution resembled the aims of the Woodstock nation and meant that young people were creating and controlling their own culture as well as their political situation, rescuing them from a cynical and corrupt older generation, the Reagan era. The idea was to make youth culture honest, accessible, and fair in all respects, on the artistic side, on the business side, and even in the audience making it the diametrical opposite of what corporate America had turned it into. After that, political change would be inevitable. Kurt didn't doubt that the Calvinists were earnest and he liked their ideas, but he also was dubious about their prospects. He found their altruism naive. They didn't seem to realize it was all a pipe dream. Everyone seems to be striving for utopia in the underground scene, but there are so many different factions and they're so segregated that it's impossible, Kurt says. If you can't get a underground movement to band together and to stop bickering about unnecessary little things then how the fuck do you expect to have an effect on a mass level this is a quote by Kurt Cobain that I should use in a video to get more people to sign the petition if you can't get an effing underground movement to band together and to stop bickering about unnecessary little things then how the F do you expect to have an effect on a mass level that's what I think about when I see all these different Kurt Cobain groups online and how they don't like each other and they won't work with each other. If every supporter came under one banner, under one group, say, I don't know, signed the petition, there would be change. You could make change. But we, we're, we're so busy bickering about, uh, well, whose group is it going to be? Who's the biggest group? Who, who, who do we like the best? You know, it doesn't matter. What do you mean when, when he says unnecessary little things, bickering about unnecessary little things? I don't care if I have to join someone else's banner as long as everybody gets together under one flag. I hope that you understand what I mean. Kurt even felt that pressure was being put on Nirvana to help with the revolutionary effort. I just felt that my band was in a situation where it was expected to fight in a revolutionary sense towards the major corporate machine, says Kurt. It was expected by a lot of people. A lot of people just flat out told me that you can really use this as a tool. You can use this as something that will really change the world. I just thought, how dare you put that kind of fucking pressure on me? It's stupid and I feel stupid and contagious. So Teen Spirit is alternately a sarcastic reaction to the idea of actually having a revolution, yet it also embraces the idea. But the point that emerges isn't just the conflict of two opposing ideas, but the confusion and anger that that conflict produces in the narrator. He's angry that he's confused. It's fun to lose and to pretend, acknowledges the thrill of altruism, even while implying that it's plainly futile. The entire song is made up of contradictory ideas, Kurt says. It's just making fun of the thought of having a revolution, but it's a nice thought. Part of embracing the revolution is blasting the apathetic types who aren't part of it. Even Kurt admits that his generation is more blighted by apathy than most. Oh, absolutely, he says, especially people in rock bands who aren't educated. That's also an attack on us. We were expected to shed a minimal amount of light on our ideals where we come from but we're not even capable of that really we've done a pretty good job of it but that was never our goal in the first place we wanted to be a fucking band i didn't want to be the spokesman of a generation i just wanted to have a good band that's what i'm hearing when i read this and there were people telling me you have a voice now you need to use it for the right thing but he's saying maybe i'm not educated enough maybe i'm not articulate enough to say the right things in my songs. And this puts a lot of pressure on you and I could understand where he's coming from. You know, I wish I was more intelligent. I wish I was more articulate so I could make my videos more interesting. I, I, I totally understand where he's coming from. That would be an immense amount of pressure. Stress you the F out. And I think that's why he loved Courtney Love in the beginning because she enjoyed the pressure. She welcomed it and she unburdened him like, hey, if you don't want to deal with this, let me speak for you or you, you speak through me. But, you know, then she would reword it and manipulate situations to fit her own hidden agendas. Teen Spirit sounds violent. The drums clearly take a vicious pounding. The guitars are a swarming mass of barely contained brutality. The vocals are more screamed than sung. I don't think of the song like that, Kurt says. It's really not that abrasive of a song at all. Really, it only really screams at the end. 
It's so clean and it's such a perfect mixture of cleanliness and nice candy ass production. And there were soft spots in it and there was a hook that just drilled in your head throughout the entire song. It may be extreme to some people who aren't used to that type of music, but I think it's really kind of lame myself. Kurt's family turmoil may have had a lot to do with why Nirvana's music sounds so angry. I'm sure it did, Kurt says, but I have enough anger in me just toward society that I would definitely have looked for this kind of music anyhow. I hate it how even Michael Azared, people who would interview Kurt would put thoughts in his head. So listen to the way he writes this. He says, Kurt's family turmoil may have had, may have had a lot to do with why Nirvana's music sounds so angry. And then Kurt replies by saying, I'm sure it did. So this is a question that Michael Azarad put in Kurt's head, a thought. Hey, do you think maybe your family turmoil had a lot to do with this? He really wanted this book to be as interesting as possible and he needed some drama. So he kept like, well, maybe you're so angry because of your shitty life, you know? And then Kurt's like, yeah, maybe, but really I was already angry enough at society, you know, but he just keeps coming back to this family aspect of it. I'm not saying Kurt had a great life, but I don't think it was nearly as bad as we may believe it was. He was definitely neglected. He was definitely uh, abused emotionally, but who of us aren't at some point? I don't think he was ever physically abused. Dave Grohl has a slightly different take on the song's message. I don't think there was one to tell you the truth, he says. Most of it has to do with the title of the song, and that was just something that a friend had written on the wall. It was funny and clever. That, paired with the video of us at the pep rally from hell, I think that had a lot to do with it. Just seeing Kurt write the lyrics to a song five minutes before he first sings them, you just kind of find it a little bit hard to believe that the song has a lot to say about something. You need syllables to fill up this space, or you need something that rhymes. So going back to picking things because they fit. However, if Kurt's writing, if Kurt's choosing these things, maybe Dave doesn't understand. Um, you know, when Kurt wrote this, he was thinking of something, and it meant something to him. You know, Dave wouldn't know that. Impromptu scribblings aside, one remarkable aspect of Teen Spirit was that unlike many previous songs of its type, it didn't blame the older generation for anything. It laid the blame at the feet of its own audience. That implies a sense of responsibility that did not quite fit the slacker stereotype. Although Teen Spirit was a bold and provocative dare, Kurt feels he crossed the line into condemnation. I got caught up in pointing the finger at this generation, says Kurt results of that are not very positive at all. All it does is alienate people and make them feel the same feeling you get from an evil stepdad. It's like, you'd better do it right, or you'd better be more effective, or I'm not going to like you anymore. I don't mean to do that because I know that throughout the 80s, my generation was fucking helpless. There was so much right-wing power that there was almost nothing we could do. I know that I've probably conveyed this feeling of Kurt Cobain hates his audience because they're apathetic, which isn't the case at all. Within the last two years, I've noticed a consciousness that's way more positive, way more intelligent in the younger generation, and the proof is in stupid things like Sassy Magazine and MTV in general. Whether you want to admit that or not, there's a positive consciousness and people are becoming more human. I've always been optimistic, but it's the little Johnny Rotten inside of me that has to be a sarcastic asshole. Introducing that song in the position that we were in, I couldn't possibly say that I was making fun or being sarcastic or being judgmental toward the youth rock movement because I would have come across as instantly negative. I wanted to fool people at first. I wanted people to think that we were no different than Guns N' Roses because that way they would listen to the music first, accept us, and then maybe start listening to a few things that we had to say after the fact, after we had the recognition. It was easier to operate that way. In Bloom was originally aimed at the dilettantes of the underground scene, the jocks and shallow mainstream types who had begun to blunder into Nirvana shows after Bleach but remarkably it translated even better to the kind of mass popularity the band enjoyed. The song mixes images of fertility and decay with a chorus about a gun-toting guy who likes to sing along to Nirvana's music, but he knows not what it means. The brilliant irony is that the tune is so catchy that millions of people actually do sing along to it. It's also a good description of former band members like Jason Everman, Dave Foster, and Aaron Burkhard, who were honestly attracted to the band's music but did not quite go along with Kurt and Chris' punk rock ethos. Come As You Are sounds unlike anything else on the record. 
With its mysteriously murky, watery feeling, it shows Kurt's metamorphosis from misanthrope to a more open-minded person. I'm tired of people passing judgments on one another and expecting people to live up to their expectations, says Kurt. I'm a Pisces, and it's a natural thing for Pisces to be upset with people and expect them to be a certain way, and then they aren't. So you're just mad at them all the time. I just got tired of it. The narrator admits that he's unsure how the other person will be, but is ready to accept the other person, contradictions and all. Furthermore, he adds that he won't be judgmental when the meeting occurs, and I swear that I don't have a gun. It's a remarkably beautiful sentiment. More dualities emerge as Kurt beckons someone to take your time, hurry up, and to come doused in mud, soaked in bleach. Kurt is full of opposites too. Masculine, feminine, violent, nonviolent, pop, punk. He's decided to accept it all, to come as he is. Perhaps instead of resolving the contradictions, he'll let them live together under one roof, sometimes warring, sometimes joining to produce a powerful third entity. That's pretty that's pretty cool lines actually. That's some pretty creative writing. Good job, old boy, Azerati. Once Breed builds up its hurtling momentum, Kurt wails, I don't care, half a dozen times, and then I don't mind. And finally, I'm afraid. Saying about as much about the straight line between apathy, ignorance, and fear as needs to be said, I don't mind if I don't have a mind is merely icing on the cake. The title of Lithium is an update on Marx's description of religion as the opiate of the masses. Kurt says that the song may well have been inspired by Jesse Reed's family, the only born-agains he had ever had direct contact with. Kurt says he isn't necessarily anti-religion. Keep in mind, when Kurt lived with Jesse Reed and his father, his father was in this old 60s surfer band and then he found religion. Kurt did, according to Jesse Reed's father, uh, went to church with him a few times, you know, except to Jesus Christ. I don't think he was baptized or anything like that, but Kurt was looking for something and he did try out religion for a time. I hope that he found what he was looking for before his demise. Buddhism seemed to be a major part of the last couple years of his life. Probably a lot of Courtney's influence, um, more a philosophy than a religion. I've always felt that some people should have religion in their lives, Kurt says. That's fine. If it's going to save someone, it's okay. And the person in that song needed it. The song is not strictly autobiographical, but it's easy to see a resemblance between Kurt's despair and loneliness in Olympia and the sorry state that the character is in. Kurt didn't find religion that winter of 1990, but he did find another kind of nirvana. Polly is based on an actual incident which occurred in Tacoma in June of 1987. Oh man. <sighs> A 14-year-old girl returning from a punk show at the Community World Theater was kidnapped by a man named Gerald Friend. And it actually says no relation to Lawn Friend, the editor of Rip Magazine. Huh. What, a, what an odd last name, huh? So, um... Oh, man. 14-year-old girl returning from a punk show at the Community World Theater was kidnapped by a man named Gerald Friend, no relation to Lawn Friend, who hung the girl upside down from a pulley attached to the ceiling of his mobile home and did things to her with a whip, a razor, hot wax, a blowtorch. She later escaped from his car when he stopped for gas. Friend was later arrested and eventually convicted and will likely spend the rest of his life in jail. Something like this should deserves capital punishment in my opinion you cannot cure that kind of sickness okay that's a mental health illness that cannot be cured it's been proven time and time again that it cannot be cured you let them out they're eventually going to do it again to somebody else and the next person might not be lucky enough to escape so there's only one cure for this and it's called um capital punishment kurt's only embellishment to the story was the hint that the woman got away by fooling the into thinking she enjoyed what he was doing to her. Sleep is a continuing theme in both Kurt's interviews and his songs. It's almost as if he's apologizing for his entire gender. I don't feel bad about being a man at all, Kurt says. There are all kinds of men that are on the side of the woman and support them and help influence other men. In fact, a man using himself as an example toward other men can probably make more impact than a woman can. Now keep in mind that we're kind of going through this right now, but for different reasons, right? We, we went through the whole Me Too thing and 
and but now it seems to be more about powerful men why are they ruling the world i mean it's always been like that it's guys like me normal guys like me we don't rule shit where we don't have any power you know and, and it seems to be normal guys who are taking the brunt of this affliction this um harassment and uh, determination to expose these men is being directed toward the wrong men only three percent of men in the world are who you're looking for right they're, they're they're the ones that control everything and abuse people and you know do things like have you pull your pants down while they pinch your butt and get your picture taken those aren't everyday men those are very very wealthy men so i don't understand all the online abuse directed at, i guess especially adult white men directed at the people who it needs to be directed at as well you also have to remember that the the whole war in bosnia is going on at this time the area of the world that christ originates from they ended up doing a charity show and raising like fifty thousand dollars for the victims of what happened in bosnia I, I hate using these words because i know my video will be demonetized and I'll, I'll make nothing but it's more important to get the message across than to worry about that mass genocide these soldiers were going in killing all the men and all the boys underage little boys killing them and then they were taking the women and impregnating them and that was their way of getting rid of this race of people getting rid of this ethnicity it was literally mass genocide if we can't kill them all we'll breed it out of them Nirvana went out of their way to do a charity show where they raised $50,000 and gave it all to a relief fund to help the women that were, you know, went through these horrible atrocities. So that could be heavy on Kurt's mind during the writing of this book and why he talks so much about the R word. A, a lot of it was Chris. Chris knew Kurt had a much bigger voice than him, and he was one of those people, and Kurt Sears saying, use your voice for this, use your voice for that. So that's a that's a big responsibility. You can't stop something like that, you know? You can't change other people. You might be able to affect some of them, but you can't change the world. And that's what they expected Kurt Cobain to do. Although the title of Territorial Pissings blasts macho posturing, the song is frequently the occasion of the band's end of set instrument smashing orgies. The lyrics are basically a handful of disconnected ideas which appealed to Kurt. He explains the opening words of the song, When I Was an Alien, by revealing that he always wanted to believe he was really from outer space. The fantasy, which he only recently stopped playing with in his mind, was that he was actually an alien foundling. I wanted to be from another planet really bad, says Kurt. Every night I used to talk to my real parents and my real family in the skies. I knew that there were thousands of other alien babies dropped off and they were all over the place and then I'd met quite a few of them. For Kurt, the fantasy supported the idea that there's some special reason for me to be here. Coincidentally, the creatures in Kurt's paintings look remarkably like artist renderings of aliens which have appeared in everything from the Weekly World News to the cover of Communion, Whitley Stryver's allegedly non-fiction book about close encounters with beings from outer space. The song also proves that Kurt wasn't above pinning a few lyrical clinkers. Just because you're paranoid, doesn't mean they're not after you. It's a pretty hoary coffee mug adage. Never met a wise man. If so, it's a woman. The biggest piece of proof that I have is that there are hardly any women who have been in charge of starting a war, Kurt says. They're actually less violent. By this time, one begins to wonder how Kurt rationalizes being a man at all. His first response is revealing. I don't know, he says. Castration? Later on in, on a plane, he is neutered and spayed. And in Come As You Are, he doesn't have a gun. It's been pointed out many times that the first three songs on the album mention guns. Dave Grohl's father tried to make an analogy about that, Kurt says. Something about how I tie guns with my penis. I don't know why. I wasn't conscious of the fact that I mentioned guns three times. I've tried to figure out an explanation for it myself, and I can't. I really can't. To paraphrase Dr. Freud, sometimes a gun is just a gun, but not this time. Drain You is a love song, or rather a song about love. In Kurt's universe, the two babies of the song represent two people reduced to a state of perfect innocence by their love. I always thought of two brat kids who are in the same hospital bed, he says. The lyrics mix the utter dependence of infants with their narcissism. 
I don't care what you think, unless it is about me, one of them says. Although there is an obvious sexual connotation, the image of draining off an infection mainly has to do with relieving the other of bad feelings, like sucking out the venom from a snake bite. The medical theme, the song is rife with fluids, infection, and vitamins, would dominate the next album. The title of Lounge Act came from the fact that we just thought that song sounded like such a lounge song, says Kurt, like some bar band would play. But the lyrics are nothing of the kind. That song is mostly about having a certain vision and being smothered by a relationship and not being able to finish what you wanted to do artistically because the other person gets in your way, Kurt says. The line that goes, I've got this friend you see who makes me feel, refers to some of Kurt's Olympia friends and the Riot Girl movement who inspired Kurt to surrender his misanthropy and break out of what he calls the nihilistic monk world that he had made for himself in his little shoebox of an apartment. Stay away. Now, in interviews, he would say it was about uh, Toby Vale and her wanting to have sort of a being a part of this Calvinist, the the you know bohemian hippie swinger community her wanting to um have this open relationship and nobody owns anybody you know um i, I think i got into that in, in another video but stay away undoubtedly began as an indictment of the calvinist scene in olympia but in a broader sense it could apply to any conformist clique monkey see monkey do i don't know why i'd rather be dead than cool the title of on a plane could be read as a pun as an airplane although he was otherwise miserable kurt had realized his dreams by the time he had written that song he was getting flown to la and new york because big record companies desperately wanted to sign his band i suppose it's some way of me saying i'm still complaining and bitching about things but i really have it better off than i had ever expected to be kurt admits Part of the lyrical motif of On a Plane is the construction of the song itself. I'll start this off without any words, Kurt begins. He explains the line. Somewhere I have heard this before, in a dream my memory has stored. By saying that, I'd heard that bridge in some other song. I don't know what it is, Kurt says. I'll find out someday. He adds with enough sarcasm in his voice to imply that he means that the original author will slap him with a copyright suit. When he wrote one more special message to go, then I'm done and I can go home, he meant that On a Plane was the last song that he had to write lyrics for. It is now time to make it unclear, to write off lines that don't make sense. That was my way of saying the first couple of lines seem like statements, but they don't have any meaning, says Kurt. I'm just making it obvious that there's really no meaning in it, so don't take it too seriously. But perhaps he's protesting too much. My mother died every night, and the black sheep got blackmailed again, are loaded with personal resonance for Kurt. The former line sounds like a reference to Wendy's traumatic experience with her abusive boyfriend. Kurt often refers to himself as a black sheep, make these points to him and he shrugs, laughs quietly, and mumbles, I don't know. After such revealing lines, it is now time to make it unclear, seems like an attempt by Kurt to cover his tracks, as if he's given too much away. For all his disavow of most of the other songs on the record, Kurt does acknowledge that something in the way is about his experiences living under the bridge in Aberdeen. It's exaggerated for effect, though. That was like if I was living under the bridge and I was dying of AIDS. If I was sick and I couldn't move and I was a total street person, he says. That was kind of the fantasy of it. Although Kurt roundly rejected the spokesman of a generation tag, he will admit that the album did crystallize something about his peers. Oh, definitely, he says. We're a perfect example of the average uneducated 20-something in America in the 90s. Definitely and the 20-somethings are the generation that's been led to believe that they missed out on all of the best times. That's pretty much the definition of what we are, is punk rockers who weren't into punk rock when it was thriving, Kurt says. All my life, that's been the case, because when I got into the Beatles, the Beatles have been broken up for years, and I didn't even know it. I was real excited about going to see the Beatles, and I found out they had broken up. Same thing with Led Zeppelin. They'd broken up years before already, but there's more to it than that. I think there's a universal display of psychological damage that everyone my age has acquired, Kurt says. I notice a lot of people, a lot like me, who are neurotic in certain social situations. I just noticed that everyone in their early 20s have been damaged by their parents equally. Kurt describes a scenario in which his generation's parents grew up in the bland, conformist 50s and early 60s. 
then had kids just as the late 60s began. The onslaught of new ideas threw their old values into a tailspin and they reacted by drinking and doing drugs and getting divorces. Every parent made the same mistake, Kurt says. I don't know exactly what it is, but my story is exactly the same as 90% of everyone my age. Everyone's parents got divorced. Their kids smoked pot all through high school. They grew up during the era when there was a massive communist threat and everyone thought we were going to die from nuclear war. And more and more violence started to infuse into our society. And everyone's reaction is the same. And everyone's personalities are practically the same. There's just a handful of people my age, there's maybe five different personalities, and they're all kind of intertwined with one another. I think that's pretty accurate. If you came of age in the 90s, it's a pretty accurate statement. I don't think our musical version of that is any different than any of the other bands that have come out at the same time we have, Kurt says. I don't think we're more special as far as having that same kind of damage that our parents or society gave us. It's the same. We got more attention because our songs have hooks and they kind of stick in people's minds. All these kids my age found themselves asking the same question at the same time. Why the fuck are my parents getting a divorce? What's going on? Something's not right. Something about the way our parents were brought up isn't the way it's supposed to be. They fucked up somewhere. They're living in a fantasy world. They must have done something wrong. Those are some tough thoughts to have, especially if, like Kurt, you were eight years old. Analyzing his own songs at length reminded Kurt of something. I'm just starting to realize why I had such a hard time with interviews when this record came out, he said. People were going through the songs and trying to get me to explain them, and I just don't even have any opinions on them. They are all basically saying the same thing. I have this conflict between good and evil and man and woman, and that's about it. Next up, chapter 10. That's interesting. If, now that I think about it, if you think about Kurt's lyrics, it is a lot about man and woman and good and evil and what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman and, and uh, you know, are we filling these gender roles correctly or is there something we should change? Which I, you know, I think it was pretty clear he was saying that men needed to change. I'm not quite sure what he thought about women, if they needed to change or not. But, man, what a, what a thought-provoking chapter that was. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, especially since it kind of touched on things that I've spoken about in videos. If you really pay attention to what I'm saying, a lot of what was in chapter nine has been in my videos within speculation and opinion and, and stuff like that. So now you know where I'm getting it from, right? If you made it this far, thank you so much for staying with me. I had planned a replacing Kristen Fat video, which is still going to come out, but I have Max Wallace scheduled in two days time. Uh, hopefully that'll go through without any issues whatsoever. And uh, we'll hear what he has to say on the channel. People have been known to change their minds and cancel on me. Let's hope that that does not happen. I'm pretty sure Wallace is straight up and I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. So having said that, I'll see you in the next one. Please do not forget to press the like button so this video is suggested to more people. Subscribe if you have not subscribed, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.